Coming up, a very special Christmas gift just for you, an exclusive mini documentary on an 80s classic from several superstars. This song has been number one four different times, and in the process, it's changed the world. It started out as an idea when an 80s icon saw devastating suffering happening on television. So he called his famous musical pal. The two of them made a plan to write a song. Their goal was to try and get a Christmas number one to raise money to help those who were suffering. And then they started bumping into some of the biggest bands and singers on the street at random. And the word spread as they called their friends. And they were going to meet and all sing this song, record it. But nobody bothered to speak to management for any of them. So up to the moment of the recording session, the two friends had no idea if any of these guys would show up. They had less than a month to record, distribute, and promote the record to try and get to that number one by Christmas. Several of the legends who were part of this revolutionary event share a truly miraculous story, the miraculous story of Do They Know It's Christmas and how it changed everything, leading to We Are the World, to Live Aid, so much more. In this definitive account coming up next on Professor of Rock, make sure to subscribe, share your memories of this incredible song below. This is brought to you by Zenny Eyewear. Here's the story of Do They Know It's Christmas from Those Who Made It Happen. Okay, and then we're going to take you back to last year. In fact, the December of last year. How did you get the call? What do you remember about Band-Aid and how that all came together? Well, we've had time to discuss it now. And uh, there's lots of things I don't remember. So I, I actually spoke to Mitch and I said, how did we first meet? And he said, I don't know. I said, no, neither do I. <laughs> okay, so that's that. It's Christmas time. Bob saw the BBC TV reporter, Michael Burke, and he sees the famine that's going on in Ethiopia. And this was like biblical famine in the 20th century. Yeah. Nobody ever seen anything like this. Paula, Bob's girlfriend, was um, co-hosting a music show in the north of England in yeah. Newcastle. And uh, I was playing on the show and I'd known Bob and Paula for a long time. And I was chatting to Paula, who was hugely pregnant. Bob was at home, Boomtown Rats were finished. He was house babysitting or whatever he was doing. And he called Paula and said, I've just seen this hideous thing. And she said, Mid just standing next to me. And she handed me the phone <laughs> and he said, look, I want to do something. I'm not in a position powerful enough to do anything. Will you help? Can you can we meet up when you get back? So we met up in London a couple of days later. And uh, and you have to kind of imagine this because it's really quite sad. There's two songwriters, two multi-platinum selling songwriters sitting together for two hours trying to figure out how we could generate income for the, this famine and finally coming to the ultimate conclusion that we are absolutely useless at everything except maybe putting a good song together. So we decided to write a Christmas song and a Christmas song specifically because this was October or something, we were talking about this. To I read it was November, November 5th that November, you guys had yeah, that lunch you. meeting. That's a year, thank you, I'm glad Jeez. you know this stuff. So it was, it was very tight. If you could get a number one record in the UK charts just before Christmas, the yeah. charts freeze. So you can sell two or three times as many. At Christmas uh, number one. Christmas number one always sells a lot more than any other number one. And we couldn't do a, a cover version of a standard Christmas song because 50% of the income goes to the songwriters. We had to write something and then donate the songwriting royalties. Yep. So uh, so I went home and wrote on my little Casio keyboard, da 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 came up with this jingly bells thing. And sent it to Bob on a cassette who hated it. And then he <laughs> came he over to- He thought it sounded like the theme to Z cars, Z right? cars, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an old <laughs> TV tune. It's nothing like that, but in Bob's head, that's what it was like. <laughs> And he came to my place uh, with a guitar. He's a left-handed guitarist, but an up he plays a right-handed guitar and it was upside down. And, and he sang this thing at me and it, every time he sang it, it was different. He was obviously just making us up. Uh, he had the bones of a set of lyrics. And I said, well, look, leave it with me and I'll try and put this together, these things, these incompatible things. And I just finished building a studio in the bottom of a garden. So I went to the studio and I spent four days playing all the instruments, you know, building this thing up layer by layer, trying to get an arrangement built, put in the middle eight and you know, trying to get this thing to work in some kind of right. you know, order. Because it starts with the clanging chimes of doom, mm -hmm. this dark, ominous, moody, atmospheric, sad intro. But then it has to finish with this kind of sing-along thing at the end. 
And again, it's a song with no chorus. The hook comes at the very end of the song. Right. And at that point, it's too late. You know, you've bought the record. I don't care whether you like it or not. That's the hook at the end, you know. And it was just an odd construction, but um, we figured out that if we pulled in enough talented people uh, to come and add their strength to it, we might get ourselves a Christmas number one. It might generate £100,000. That's that's the number we, we had in our heads. And of course, it generated a lot more than that. It generated and... a lot more than that. It, 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 this, there was the one day in the studio that everyone saw with all the artists there. And, uh, I'm behind the mixing desk 99% of the time trying to pull this thing together. And there was a moment when, after the 24-hour period recording all the vocals, which none of the artists had heard, because nobody could hear it until you walked into the studio. Yeah. You know, it's something that we take for granted. You can email somebody a track and you can hear it and learn it, walk into the studio and sing your part. So they were walking in cold. So uh, doing that, doing Phil Collins' drums and mixing the record because I had to be in the pressing plants by eight o'clock the next morning. And I read so, that Bob would keep coming in and saying, sing this part, and you'd be like, Bob, no, no, tell well, me about that. Well, <laughs> Bob, Bob's sense of melody is all over the shop. So he, he, you know, you'd have you know, Boy George or somebody in there, or you know, whoever, Tony Hadley, he's then there singing these things. Bob's going, no, no, sing it like, it won't be snowing out because Christmas time. You'd have gone, what are you singing? That's not what we wrote, you know? You know, there's a divide between, I, I was comfortable behind the desk and Bob's brilliant at rounding people up and, you know, g them up and getting them doing yeah. things. But God, thank God they didn't listen to him <laughs> and his, <laughs> his direction on the vocals. I think straight after, um, straight after our meeting, um, he, he, uh, he lived in Chelsea. So he lived near Kings yeah. Road in Chelsea. And he bumped into Gary Kemp, you know, from Spandau Ballet. Yeah. And then, Walked around the corner and bumped into Simon Le Bon, like you do, you know, two <laughs> of the biggest artists in the UK at the time. And of course, that's where Bob starts his trickery. He's going, well, Geran have said they're doing it, so it's fine. You, you know, you're Geran, you've got to. So all of a sudden there was a competition there. The big worry was that we hadn't actually spoken to any adults about where and when this was going to happen. So we hadn't, you know, talked to a manager who might have written down the date and the time and the place. So on that Sunday morning or whatever it was, Bob and I are standing outside this, this very empty studio on a cold, wet morning without a clue who was going to turn up. Gosh. We're thinking, if I was them and I hadn't written it down, I'd have forgotten. You'd be lying in bed in Germany somewhere after a, a wild night out doing a TV show, whatever. And they all turned up. They yeah. all turned up. We come from yeah, we've just, just come from Germany. Come from Germany. How uh, did you come to be in the first place? In a group? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in a group, so they, they invite us all along. Such a moment, right, of music can yeah. change the world. And that was yeah. kind of the beginning of that. Like, punk, I think, brought that about. I was talking to Mike Peters, yeah. The Alarm, and he said... Oh, yeah, he's a great guy, Mike. Yeah, 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 and he's like, him. you yeah, know, yeah, people yeah. talk about negativity of punk. Punk no, is positive. what brought about Live Aid and brought Absolutely, about yeah. all those changes. Yeah, I think he's right. I mean, Punk, it put music on a different level. It, it sort of gave it a different face, a different value. And I think it gave a lot of young kids a tremendous sense of hope. Definitely. That, blimey, if you can form a band, then so can uh, we. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And even but, coming from the working class yeah. and, and doing what their dad did and their dad did is like, Punk gave him that, like, we can break out. You, you can you do know? it. I mean, the, the going to the, the, the band aid thing, I mean, that was, you know, that was, I think it was Steve, Gary, and Martin were on the Kings Road in Chelsea when they met up with Geldof. And he said, you know, guys, I really want you to be on this record. There's a terrible tragedy going on in Ethiopia. We didn't, no one even knew at the time. And so they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were in Germany with the Duranis the night before. And we'd all been on the <laughs> proper. I yeah. mean, serious. <laughs> so we're all due to go in and do the song. And we didn't think, you know, we thought, oh, yeah, okay, no one's going to know anything. So we've all turned up at the airport. We're all looking dreadful, like, you know. And someone said, look, there's 300 screaming girls out. There's TV cameras and press and everything. So we're like, where's the nearest toilet? Get the hairspray out. <laughs> 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 where's the bags? You know? Yeah. And, um, and then we went to the studio and Sam, Sam West, Trevor Horn's studio. And, um, that you'd worked with before on yeah, the station. Yeah. You asked Trevor Horn to produce it at the time. 
But he was booked up and he said, I'll have time in about six weeks, but you guys said, uh, we've got to well, get it Bob faster Bob wanted Trevor, because Trevor was the hot producer at the yeah. time. He was the guy He'd to go to. He had three number one hits with Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Uh, yeah, but um, Trevor takes forever to make stuff. So it would have been an, an Easter record. And that's no good <laughs> at all. It had to be done quickly. As you said, 20 days between the meeting and coming up with the idea and Recording. executing the idea. So it was, it was short. It's short time, but he gave us 24 hours in his studio. And there's a moment on the making of video where Trevor comes in. He said, I've got this idea of doing a madrigal, you know, a kind of do they know, it's do they know, do they know. All these voices all over. Life. And he spent an hour doing this. And I'm sitting watching the clock going, oh my God, what's an hour I've not got left? It's an hour just been eaten up. And I had to say to Trevor, great idea but we can't do it today. We've got to get this done, you know? Yeah. So it, it very kindly said, oh, yeah, point taken, stood by. What was great was the fact that like, um, Cool and the gang had just yeah. arrived to do a tour. So they said, oh, you can come down as well, you know, get on the chorus. It's, it's like so many people that were there. There was a lot of people that you asked to show up like, David Bowie was supposed to sing the first line. He and Paul McCartney weren't able to move I think that was around. more in our heads. I don't think there was ever an approach made we just thought, wouldn't it be great to have Bowie do the opening line, you know, because you imagine him, you can hear him singing it now, you know. You know. But, uh, but no, he, he, he did us a big favour afterwards. He did the announcement for the first showing of the video. They give us a five minute slot before Top of the Pops, which at the time was getting to like 20 million people. Yeah. So the BBC gave us this five minute slot and we need someone with the gravitas to give this the, the, the seriousness that it needed nobody more powerful than Bowie, of course. It would be wonderful if you could all buy copies of this record over the next period through Christmas. If you can't afford them, club together with somebody else to buy a copy. You know that the money will go to the Ethiopians. Thank you. Boy George sings the last line. Tell me real quick the Boy George story. Oh, that's funny. I mean, there's a guy that wasn't even there. Well, the he wasn't he there. I mean, and we didn't, we didn't notice, and it not, <laughs> nothing to do with George. You notice George wherever you are. But we were so frantic about trying to get all of this done. You know, poor old Phil Collins popping his head up every two hours going, are you ready for me yet? And I'm going, oh, it's another 20 minutes. And, <laughs> um, and Bob noticed that he, he didn't see George. So he, he, he went to um, the drummer uh, who, was, who was there and asked him where he was. He said, he's in New York. He said, oh, yeah. what's he doing in New York? He said, oh, he's, I don't know. He's, he must have forgotten to come. <laughs> yeah. So Bob found the hotel that he was staying in Mm -hmm. and woke George up, uh, who said, what's going on? He said, it's the Band-Aid record. George said, who's there? And he said, every could be you. <laughs> he said, ah. He said, well, I've missed it now, haven't I? He said, no, you haven't. He said, there's a Concord. It's leaving at such and such a time. He said, get on Concord. And he did. He got up and he bought a ticket. Nobody bought it for him. He bought a ticket and he arrived that night in the UK about eight o'clock in the evening. And he came in and he was a bit hoarse and, you know, a bit hung over, very George. And he stood behind the mic and he said, can someone get me a brandy? And I said, I pressed the button in the intercom and said, you'll have to pop next door and buy one, George. So I said, there's nothing here, you know. And then he opened his mouth and he sang like an angel. In our world but he had to be there. He could yeah. not be there, you know. Oh, yeah. Well... Cool and the gang show up. They're a U.S. act. They're on the same label as Boomtown Rats, yeah. and they happen to be in town. But yeah. the other thing is Marilyn showed up. As I read, I'm invited. <laughs> yeah. And then Neil from the Young Ones. What the heck? Oh, that was funny. Which is funny. like when Dan Aykroyd showed up to We Are the World, which is funny. But you changed the lyric from Ethiopia to Africa because it just didn't play when you yeah, said well, there'll Bob, be snow. Uh, Bob, uh, his melody is almost as good as his timing. So, you know, and there won't be snow in Ethiopia this Christmas. It just does not work, no matter how you try and squeeze yeah. it in. So it was too cumbersome. So we just thought, no, no, was, there won't be snow in Africa this Christmas, which of course isn't true, but who cares? We, we, weren't, we weren't going for geographical yeah. points, you know. It really even wasn't about the song, it was about the movement. It wasn't the best song in the world, it was okay. But it was the idea of bringing people together. Sure. They've recorded Do They Know It's Christmas, three other versions, which all went to number one. just incredible that music had that power because it kind of felt like in the 1960s, 
Music had that power to change the world. Motown was happening, civil rights movement, and sure. the British invasion, the Beatles coming over after JFK had been assassinated, giving hope to America and, and the UK was just opening things up, rewriting the rules about what music could be. And that kind of seemed like the 70s came in and the excess started happening a little bit, drugs and things like that, and the commercialization of music. You guys brought that back in the 80s, using music to create awareness. Mm -hmm. and, and that was just incredible. I want to ask you about the Bono part because he sang that line and a lot of people didn't like that line. Tell me about that. Well, the, the line is, you know, and thank God tonight it's them instead of you, which sounds brutal. But Bob wrote the line and he wanted it to be brutal. He said, no, rather it's them than you. But thank God it's them and not you. You know, just showing how close it could be. Things can turn on a toss of a coin, you know, th yeah. things can change for us. We, we, we live in a Western world where we're reasonably safe and, you know, we've got a you know, reasonably good lifestyle and whatever. Um, and it doesn't take an awful lot to take that away, you know, for that to crumble. And we could find ourselves in the same kind of situation, no food, no prospects, no future, stuck in the middle of a, you know, a civil war you know, a, a war torn country, all of that's like, you could, it could happen to anybody. And Bono said, I'm really uncomfortable singing this. You know, and Bob explained it to him and he said, okay. But when I had sung that line with a guide vocal for everyone to hear the song, I just sung it on a, on a lower octave, just, you know, and tonight, thank God, the same as any of you. And when it came around, Bono, without being at the prompted, just kind of went for what felt comfortable to him. I'd thank God it's them instead of you. Yeah. You know, after this discussion about the line, and he just, we stood back and went, God, where did that come from? Because it wasn't just, it wasn't just the power of the line. It was the feeling behind it. And, yeah. and it, it's not like when somebody had said, you've really got to scream this out. It just, it was heartfelt and it just, that one line at that key moment turned the entire song round. Up to that part, it was droney, it was sad, it was atmospheric, it was, you know, it was kind of textural. And then all of a sudden the whole thing just went into a whole different level. And that was just a bit of magic that happened, you know. Had it been someone else trying to sing that line, it might not have had the same effect. power of all of you guys together singing, putting your egos at the door. And that's what's cool is that Bob kind of came up with that because where the world copied that. Quincy Jones said, put your ego at the door. It was exactly that. You know, it, um, it, it, everyone thinks that musicians all know each other all the time. And it, we don't. We, we pass each other in the corridor of television shows, too busy sucking our cheeks in and trying to be haughty, you know, aloof. There we were in this room. Some who knew each other, Spandau and Duran obviously knew each other. There was a big rivalry going on between them. There was nothing went on, nothing. We had no management with us. We had no record yeah. labels with us. We had nothing. There was nothing. It was an empty studio. You walked in and you did your bit. And the funny thing was, as you walk in, yeah, there's maybe a, 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 a nervousness, a tension. You imagine being the first vocalist up to walk into that great big empty space with a microphone in it and a camera stuck in your face. And all of your contemporaries are all in the control room at the window, all doing that, all watching you. <laughs> and it's 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning and you've got to sing. You know, that's intimidating, that's scary stuff. But by the end of the night, I had to throw them all out because they were having such a good time bonding and hanging out because they all felt there was something special going on that day. So I find these, I don't know, 30 sad souls, all with loads of money in their pocket, with London at their fingertips, right on the doorstep on a Sunday evening, and they didn't want to leave. They didn't want to go out. I had to kick them all out the studio and say, <laughs> I need the quiet now to mix this. You gotta mix this thing, mix this. Out. this has got to be good. And it was very British. It was very, oh, would you like a cup of tea? Oh, would you like a biscuit? You know, it's just like, you know, lunch was a chicken drumstick and a sausage roll, you know, and, and uh, it, it's, uh, and it was great. And I was the first one to go and sing my two lines. And we were all in the control oh, yeah. room listening to the, the song. 
Probably a little nervous. And Midge and Trevor to be your first. and uh, Bob and stuff. And, you know, Geldof can't do the accent. Oh, go on, Adley. Get in there. Go on. You can go and do first. I went, okay. But, and then you got all your contemporaries in there. And anyway, so I did two takes and that was it. Yeah, I mean, yeah next one then. So it was great, I mean, but it, I was bloody nervous though, yeah, you know. Oh, yeah. So, well, but it was an amazing moment. I know that they would definitely got the slot, the middle slot for me where it goes, here's to you, raise a glass for everyone. Here's to you, raise a glass for everyone. And I did that bit. I got there quite early as well. And then there was a lot of hanging around because everybody had to stay to film the choruses. And then they asked me back in. And uh, I thought that they'd had a discussion, like, who are we going to get? Who are we going to get to sing the first line? And uh, eventually they decided, you know. But Midge has let me in on the fact that they did actually try other people as well. <laughs> 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 they were hedging their bets. We let in light and vanish shade. But I still got it. So. You did? So they must have gone, I'd listen to them all go, sounds best when Paul does it, you know. So, um, and they chose mine. We let in light and we vanish shade. You're in yeah. the studio with a mic all by yourself. They're looking in and everybody really brought their best to it. Yeah. Not only because of what the song meant, mm. but also because... You got your contemporaries around. You, you want to yeah. you want to let it rip. <laughs> you got to be on the money, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was a certain amount of that, and I was probably the newest star on the block at that point. So I could see Sting over by the bar where they were making coffee and stuff. Dan go over and say hello, you know, and all that stuff. But he he was talking to Bono in deep conversation because they'd obviously met many times, you know. So I, I was a little bit didn't know who to speak to. But I knew Tony Hadley, and the States Quo boys are very friendly, you know, so they were looking after me, as it were. Well, George Michael, of course, now you look back and you see him give his vocal. What do you remember about George? Of course, you've sung with George before. You sang uh, with mm -hmm. Ian Elton when you did uh, yeah. Every Time You Go Away. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, I really liked George. I thought he was a really nice guy. He was very smart, really smart. You know, I, I, I think it takes a lot to take on the role of being a pop star. And he just managed to get into it the right amount of honesty without giving too much of yourself away. So in the end, you feel like you got nothing, you know. So um, I always thought I need to learn a few tricks from him, you know. And uh, but we used to bump into each other in restaurants around the place. I remember they they kept uh, the ivy open uh, in the UK. So we were just sat on the table talking for ages. Uh, I just found him a very interesting person. I think it did get to him in the end, you know, it, it, it's uh, when it's hard to have your own life. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a sad thing, but he was such a nice guy. In the next 10 or 20 years, it's even going to mean more every year because George Michael is no longer with us. Yeah. yeah. What you, and, 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 uh, and, and of course, David Bowie. And yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few. I mean, the, the, there was talk recently, not from us, but a lot of people asking, could we get the original lineup together to go and do something as an anniversary? Which will never happen now because it's, it's gone, you know. But, uh, you know, Rick Parfitt from Status Quo is gone now as well. So um, maybe some, some things are best just being left where they are. It was a magic moment in time and, and it would be it'd be a sin to kind of do it. a bit like if the Beatles could get back together. Oh, would yeah. you really want to see it? Would it live up to the <laughs> the, the dreams that we've built up over the years of how wonderful it must have been? Uh, maybe it wouldn't. So yeah. maybe it's just best left the way it the way it actually was. But yeah, it was um, it was a fantastic thing. So and George, um, his solo was great as well. Everyone stepped up to the mark. There's you know there's not a bad performance no. on there. Um, and I think it was because of that, you know, the, the, the goldfish bowl scenario, you know, all your contemporaries are all standing there watching. They want to see what you're capable of doing. And they were all great. You know, a couple of them managed to get to my little studio beforehand and record a couple of harmonies and a couple of lines. But then once they heard the quality of everyone else, they wanted to redo their bits. <laughs> <laughs> it's the insecurity of the, oh, uh, the yeah. musician, you know. Yeah, it's, it's the way and Simon Le Bon, I read that they re-recorded theirs. And then, of course, Phil Collins. You're playing the keyboards and Adam Clayton and Andy Taylor on the bass. But 
What's cool is everybody came together to make this happen. Mike Reed releases it on the radio. So you get out there, the UK magazines donated their advertising space. What I love is it sold a million in its first week and number one for five weeks. In America, it should have been number one, but because of the way Billboard did their thing, it had to be based on airplay as well. But it sold more than the top four records that week. So it really was a number one hit as far as sales go. Sure. And of course, it outsold Mull of Kintyre, uh, which is Paul McCartney, and, and became the biggest selling UK hit of all time until Candle of the Wind 97 came out. But what was cool is the way that you and Bob stood up to Margaret Thatcher. I have to say, this is this is Bob's department. I'd, I'd be useless at yeah. shouting down the UN or, <laughs> or you know abusing the prime minister as much as they need it. Um, he's <laughs> so good at it. He's brilliant. And he he accosted Margaret Thatcher and said, "Why are you charging people VAT on this? Why are the government making money?" And she said in her inimitable style, uh, "Everyone has to pay VAT, Mr. Geldof." Then took the VAT, then donated the exact same amount in aid. So they were seen to take it with one hand, but they gave it back with the other, just to keep face. But yeah, it was uh, it was quite amazing. They redid Do They Know It's Christmas Now three times, and I'm sure it'll happen many more times with that moment's stars and the, mm. the, the chart toppers. And of course, singing the first line, 1989, Kylie Minogue sang the first line. 2004 was Chris Martin, a Coldplay. And then it was One Direction a few years ago. So <laughs> some pretty hefty company there. Yeah. It's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. I mean, this was at the moment where your star was about to shine even brighter because every time you go away, every time you go away. this record here. But what stands out to you about that session 30 plus years later? Because it inspired We Are the World and Farm Aid and Live Aid and Comic Relief and so many things. Yeah. Americans always copy the Brits, right? I mean, that's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then we copy it and we bring it back. Yeah. So, and that's the way it goes. You know, it's like, I know Hamish from the Average White Band. I said, well, was it strange to be able to, you coming from Scotland and then taking the funk back to America? You know? I know. And he said, yeah, it was strange, but he said, it was wonderful at the same time. Now it's a whole different ball game. But on the day we were doing it, we just wanted to do our best for the cause. And that was it really, you know. And when the whole thing just went, I was going, oh my God, this is incredible. And then when they announced the concert and that, I mean, Mish told me it was a bluff from beginning to end. They were telling one artist, oh, such and such an artist is going to be on there. You've got to be on there because they're on it. Yeah. They, they weren't on it. it. He hadn't asked them. You know, <laughs> it was just bluff, bluff from start to finish. <laughs> Only an Irishman. Uh, could get away with that. But it, it was such an incredible thing, all done for the first time. And when I listen to the Band-Aid record now, I get a warmth off the record because I think there was a lot of gravity behind what we were doing. And when I hear it now, I think it will be difficult to surpass that record because it's got so much weight be behind it, so, many, so much history behind it, you know. It's also the rawness too because you guys only had, I mean, talking to Midge, he had the lunch me on the 5th of November. You're in the studio. So they have 24 hours to get everybody in there, all these stars, leave your ego at the door kind of thing is what Bob said. But yeah. to be able to do that and mix it and put it all together, what a what a wave. It was, yeah. Excitement. It, it, yeah, I think, and everybody was working off that spark, you know. I mean, they probably, I, I think they started doing the, track they had to do the track the, the night before to get it ready for when the singers came in the f following day but that's such a short amount of time everybody was there in great spirits and yeah especially that last chorus when bono sings his vocal and then you're going into that and feed the world and and do they know it's christmas like yeah. that power of all those voices yeah that always gets me no matter how many and i've heard the song thousands of times, mm. but it always gets me. It was the last thing to go on. Uh, we had the entire song and, and its structure, and then the end just was a big instrumental, you know, da 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 just getting bigger and bigger each time. And Bob was sitting in my studio, and he said, look, it needs to have something people can sing. You know, like, you know, Happy Christmas, War Is Over, you know, John and Yoko. <laughs> Or 
like you said, it's got to have something that you just, and between the two of us, I think he might have said the feed the world bit and I did the, you know, letting them know it's Christmas time again. Like, and we, we, we botched this up and it was the last thing that we did, but probably the most important thing we did between the clanging chimes of the intro, because the moment that track starts, you know exactly what you're going to hear. Oh yeah. You know, and the big sing along at the end to give us the, what is now the, the de rigueur classic, you know, line up with all the headphones on, all singing the big chorus and charity records. Yeah. That was the first one to kind of do it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, they, those, the front, the top and tail were the really important part and the bono bit in the middle. I did make a lot of friends that day as well. So it was like a bringing together. Uh, so I made friends with John Taylor um, from J Duran. And uh, because we were all there on that day, it, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we've all got in common when we meet up, you know. Yeah, it was a very special feeling. Well, it did, as you said, it changed the world. It changed the way people looked at charity. I'm always one for like, if you really want to change the world, become a politician. Yeah. But as a group of musicians at the time, we did help to focus the, the politicians around the world to a terrible tragedy. And I think from that point on, people were much more charitable. I yeah, mean, we, you know, now, you know, we have these phone-ins and all sorts of stuff where they raise money for, for kids and people around the world or, or kids at home who are abused children and stuff like that. And that was the start of charity as we know it today. And I think it really, you know, people talk about a load of puffy pop stars, but, you know, well, I think we made a difference. No question. Yeah. I mean, I remember when We Are The World, which actually was inspired, obviously, by that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And buying that and hearing it on the radio. We are the we are the and then Live Aid, watching it and just... Oh, and people, Philly, London was oh, amazing. 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 Phil Collins, you guys... Duran yeah. Duran, all these bands yeah. from all walks of life. I mean, even the Beach Boys played it. It was amazing. It was so Hall cool. Of Oates, the, yeah, you know, it was, it was exactly. And you've got to remember as well, in those days, the satellite technology was, wasn't nearly as good as it is today. So everyone yeah. was worried, oh God, if the cloud goes over the satellite, we've, we're lost. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And when you guys got a chance to sing it at Live Aid, that's where David Bowie did get to participate and sing his part, Paul McCartney. Tell me about that moment. It was glorious. I mean, it was. It's funny if you if you re really look at the footage, Bob. I feel uncomfortable in things like that. I've, I've, there were so many people vying for front position at that, because it's a major, major thing. And I was kind of edging back into the crowd and Bob came out and grabbed my wrist and pulled me up and held my arm up. But what a magic moment to be on stage with all of those people singing that song and have 100,000 people in front of you yeah. singing it, let alone the millions upon millions, maybe billions who saw that on television around the world singing it. it you, nothing, it doesn't get bigger or better than that. You know, what started as a tiny little seed of an idea grew into this massive movement yeah. and made, made caring okay again. It yeah. made it all right, made it kind of cool because we used a medium that young people could understand. It was a medium that was apolitical. It was music, something that transcends borders and religions and creed and color and all the crap that we end up finding reasons to fight over, you know, all of a sudden we were all unified. That little room that we started this off in had grown to, you know, the planet and everybody wanted to see a change. And that was just incredible. Be the world. 